Hello, I'm Anne. I'm reading to you from the home of my friend, Tanta Pennington, and surrounded by her wonderful art. Uh, we are both pleased to be here on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. I thought today I'd read some poems about women. This first one is from Africa. Ahagar, named for the mountains. She lives in the Sahara, a woman eroded, worn by heat-heavy days and sandblast wind. She lives inside thick walls. Her village looks abandoned, like an old fort in the desert, crenellations crumbled and sand in the doorways. I wonder if glare invades her dark home, if heat steals her stamina and sand relentless seeps into her thoughts. At night in the chill air, the date groves quiet. She walks away from men, kitchen, smoke. She smooths argan oil into her cracked hands, offers me some from a small flask. We both rub it in, white hands and brown, over and under, her smile bright. We have no words in common, but this shared moment says we are both women with dry hands. We feel the same balm, we smell the same scent. She looks to the Milky Way, her eyes ask for something new, a gift from the universe transmitted by starlight that would land in her village, and she, with her thirsty fingers, would be the one to lift it from the sand. The saying is, women hold up half the sky, but in Africa, they hold up much more than half the sky. This poem is from Rwanda. Halo. Grass twisted and bound in a ring, oval, thick, a halo for Zavarine's head as she works on the road crew. She lifts it, turns it in her fingers, and settles it on her head. Then the first rock. She finds the flattest side, sits the rock on the grass ring. Her spine takes the weight, her neck takes the motion, her arms hang loose. She steps over ditches and garbage, steps around bicycles and students on their way to school. One rock after another, carried and dropped in a pile for the new drainage ditch. She has the pace, fast enough to avoid rebuke, slow enough to last the day. On a terraced hillside, her children wait at home. Zavarine sees the Rwandan francs, the rice, beans, and sweet potatoes she will bring them at the end of the day. She raises another rock to her head, feels its ancient weight on the grass ring halo, finds the strength needed to carry it too. These two poems are about women in British Columbia, one tragic, one uplifting. On Highway 16, Madison smiles from a poster above a police description, the when and where details of her empty truck in a campsite. May 28, 2011, the days and weeks pile up. She might be anywhere off a logging road off Highway 16, in a clearing, in a quarry, in a culvert. The RCMP say she might be in Edmonton or Vancouver, a young woman on her own working in the city. Madison's mom staples up new posters. The bold print says, reward for safe return. And I know hope can be strong but the days run on into months. The posters fade in cafe windows, wrinkle and tear on telephone poles, Madison's face covered by soccer notices and election banners. I know her mother will lie awake in the hard hours where fear lies horizontal, in the pit where words don't work, where there is no pillow soft enough to cushion the image of her truck in that campsite 
the driver's door hanging open. My daughter now lives in the north and drives Highway 16, the same curves and shoulders, the same gas stations and diners. She might be at a job site taking sediment samples or alone on the transmission line collecting data in the woods. She might stop for gas or a meal, young and friendly in her Carhartt's work clothes. She drives an old Jeep and I worry it will break down. An overheated motor, a flat tire, all it takes. Was is a small town at the northern end of Vancouver Island. Women of Was Jello wrestling. The sign on Highway 19 says Women of Was Jello wrestling, a community fundraiser for striking loggers. Who was the leader? A daredevil who said, Jello wrestling, that's it. She inflated the swimming pool, she bought the bulk jello kit, poured the bag of crystals into the pool. She added 100 gallons of water and waited waited until it gelled. The jello and an idea so tasty that it wobbled into town spirit, jiggled into the best night ever. Young women in sports bras and bike shorts wrestling in raspberries, sliding together, rolling in jello. Some not so young, but there, grappling on their gardener's knees in a red lagoon, encircled by hooting friends down in the ruby jeweled jello, laughing as they tumble, too slippery to grip, the wet women of Was wrestle the night away. Oh, the keepsake photos, the homemade trophies, their stories retold at campfire nights. Money collected, women rinsed and celebrated. Women of Was, I salute you in your woodland home, in your wild bravado. And now two poems, uh, women from history. Steatopagia, a medical condition. It's an accumulation of large amounts of fat on the buttocks, a normal condition for the Khoi Khoi peoples of Southern Africa. Steatopagia. Sarah Bartman, a Khoi Khoi woman born in South Africa, 1789 a woman with large buttocks, her natural body. Not a freak, nor a hot and taut Venus, not a specimen or a cartoon. And no, she had never mated with an orangutan. Sarah didn't need an owner or trainer, a stage or a cage. She didn't need an audience who saw her as a link instead of a woman. How she must have gritted her teeth in London, tuppence to see her, tuppence to poke her with a finger or stick. Coercion or consent? The high court ruled consent. Sarah sold to a circus in Paris, made to turn and bend for the curious crowd, their gawking eyes, her bare brown skin. Whispers, sniggers behind gloved hands, ladies happily shocked, men feigning scientific interest, as they circled the pedestal. She read their body language. Scientists cloaked in comparative anatomy studied the female savage, measured and weighed, sketched and painted her, profited from caricatures sold on the boulevards, compared her to a monkey. When she died, scientists bottled her remains, labeled her organs in jars, shelved her womb beside her buttocks, her labia spotlit under glass. Her skeleton and body cast on display until 1976. Nelson Mandela requested her remains. 2002, a woman finally returned home.
Finally, we can never really know what goes on in someone's marriage. So this is a woman I would really like to talk to. Mrs. Columbus in her library. Cristoforo married me for my library. I know he did. Not the family wealth, as others suspected, although I'm sure he calculated the cost of three ships, three crews, and supplies for a long voyage. He came into the library one morning in spring, lilacs at the windows, my dress to match, but his eyes fell on the shelves. Atlases, log books, sea journals, his fingertips grazed their spines. I waited untouched, quiet beside the glass cases, knowing he would come to them. Three quick steps across the room, a hurried bonjourno, he gasped at the astrolabes laid out before him, his mind on latitude, not on me. Christoforo wooed me with dedication, praised my temperament and my collection of charts, he explored my tomes and heart with unequal passion. He strayed from the love seat, chose a compass over a book of love poems. A sand glass took his fancy while I counted the minutes, guessed how long it would take him to ask for my hand, library included, Father's School of Navigation, part of the dowry. Oh, I knew his heart was on the sea and mine ashore among my books. Spices from India, silks from the Orient, these are not the riches I desire. I'll be here with scrolls and parchments, texts from ancient Greece and Rome. The curvature of the earth, more compelling than the curvature of my breast. Be gone then, cast off, I told him, and sail to your more alluring horizon. But what is marriage but exploration? Uncharted waters, undiscovered lands. I can abide a husband on the other side of the world. Gone for years, maybe gone forever. Yes, take the cross staff and quadrant, farewell. Measure celestial bodies to your heart's content. Mm -hmm.